It's becoming beard-like. It's it's leaving its uh, its uh, pupil goatee phase. What? I don't I don't like the I don't like my goatee. There's a spot here that like is always like I'm waiting. I'm hoping. You know, I had two kids. Nothing. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to bring myself to, to shave again. Is it working? Um, Tobias Burble. Club. We are your hosts this evening. I am Tobias and this is Will. Uh, together we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand-Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you're all now members, provided you adhere to the philosophy, ex curiositas scientia. 
We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. Uh, the lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. And now let's give a warm curiosity club welcome to Charles Morbin. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be talking about the history of people looking inside of other people and also a little bit about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis looking inside of other people. The history of endoscopy is interesting in and of itself, but it's also interesting because it's like the history of anything. It's also the history of everything. It's the history of light, lenses, magnets. Um, so I think I'm, I've made an effort to explore some of the foundations of scientific development that underpin the, uh, the individual innovations in endoscopy itself. So endoscopy has come about because people want to know what's going on inside of other people without killing them by looking inside of them. And uh, that's a difficult proposition. Um, it's easy to look inside of a, ca a cadaver, and obviously uh, it's not so easy to look inside of a living human being. This is a really nice uh, anatomy. Obviously, humans don't do this. They can't do this. So you need to develop tools and techniques to try to get into the darker spaces deeper within if you want to look at them or do things to them. This is a, an anatomical drawing by Giulio Cassieri from the 17th century. I kind of like it. Um, so the, the main components of endoscopy, as far as I could tell when I was reading about the history of endoscopy and thinking about the history of endoscopy are you need something to extend into the body. You need a way of getting into the stomach or getting into the colon or the small intestine or the bladder or the uterus or wherever you want to go. So you need something to extend into the body without killing the person that you're extending into. So that's one thing. You need somehow to shed light into the cavity because it's lightless. And you need to have a way of getting the information, the visual information that, that the light uh, allows you to receive back to you wherever you are outside of the person. Guru Ramba uh, reads vomiting. Uh, doesn't exist on the internet yet. Um, so a um, few thousand years after the Egyptians, um, people started to become proficient in smelting bronze. Bronze is a combination of copper and tin. Um, this is a, a recreation of uh, techniques that people probably use. You can see a kind of bellows with some uh, tubes to uh, concentrate the air to get the fire really hot um, to make bronze. And so with bronze, you can make delightful tools like this. Uh, this is uh, Hippocrates, uh, um, as I'm sure you all know, is considered to be the father of the father of Western medicine. He devised a number of surgical instruments. He drew drawings of them. There are extant copies of instruments from the time that he was using these instruments. Um, this is a vaginal speculum with a little screw that, you know, um, kind of extends the bill. It's made of bronze. Um, it again, you. The, the light source is natural light, and um, you're really just kind of making the opening larger to look. Not a whole lot happened for a thousand or so years. Um, there was a, uh, is Moore, is Moorish politically incorrect? A Moorish uh, physician by the name of Abu al Hasim Khalaf ibn al Abbas al Zarawi, or as the Westerners called him, Albucasis. And uh, he 
also pioneered a variety of surgical tools and specula. These are called specula. Speculum just means look, like spectator or whatever. Um, these are tools that help you look at stuff inside the body. Um, he was a great pioneer. Um, not a whole lot happened for another 700 years until this chap came along. He was uh, very odd, very brilliant, Italian, German fellow who died very young, who invented this thing. It's called the Lichtleiter, which uh, translates as light conductor. And basically, it's a little sheet metal container with a candle inside, and then it's got a, a sort of speculum on the end. It doesn't have any lenses. He experimented with using mirrors to concentrate the image that came back to him so he could see stuff better. Um, one of the really cool things, so obviously candles are hot. You don't want to put like a hot piece of metal into someone's butt, for example. <laughs> uh, so, sorry. Um, so, the... Uh, great, great. Um, so... So he um, covered the, the, the actual case for the candle in leather, actually cardboard and then leather on the outside to contain the heat. Um, it's, an ins it's an insulated um, hot light. He also did a very interesting thing where he placed the candle on a, um, a very delicately weighted spring so that as it lost wax, it would really good if you, it's, it's a technical paper about how to build this thing for other physicians of the, of the time. He's like, if you build it according to my specifications, it'll actually work it's so good that if you put a piece of paper with writing on it in the uterus of a dead woman, you could read it through her vagina. <laughs> it's kind of an odd way of uh, making claims about the <laughs> efficacy of your tool, in my opinion. Uh, he himself died in a kind of sad way. Um, he died when he was the same number of years as I am. He, uh, was treating a bunch of patients with typhus, um, and then he himself acquired typhus and died of typhus. And his three small children were given over to friends. I find a, a tremendous amount of pathos in that last sentence. Um, but he was a real pioneer, very, very bold, very, very brilliant. Without him, endoscopy probably wouldn't have um, advanced in the same way that it did. Lens grinding started to get really good in the 17th and 18th century. Um, the next sort of advance in endoscopy came with a French chap named Desormeaux, uh, who there are a couple changes. He put a lens to concentrate the light um, so that he could see things more clearly. Um, and then he also got a different light source that burns a little more cool. Um, it's, uh, he called it gazogen. It's a com combination of turpen turpentine and alcohol. Um, and you can see there's a little lamp at the bottom. Uh, it would burn in a pretty controlled way instead of like a wax candle, which is even with the spring, kind of an uncontrolled delivery system for light. He also put some curves in his tools to look inside of uh, organs that are curved. And to do that, he needed some very fancy, very small fitted mirrors. And so that was another kind of technological innovation that was happening at the time that enabled him to uh, make these tools. These are for looking inside of the bladder. Still, I would say in general, there's not a lot of real benefit to any of the people who are undergoing these procedures. <laughs> Their great, great, great grandchildren um, benefited from the advancements that were made possible by this experimentation, I would say. Um, this dude uh, came along in 1868. He benefited from the um, apparently really ancient uh, tradition of sword swallowing which um, I know people say prostitution is the oldest profession, but from what I could tell, uh, sword swallowing dates back to at least the fifth millennium 
BCE, which I didn't know. Um, and I guess, I don't know, it seems like a very dangerous profession, but it's, uh, it still happens to this day. So Paul is like, I want to look in the stomach. It's really far away. The stomach's like a foot and a half away from the mouth. It's, uh, it's really far. You know, if you look at these little things, it's, it's not very long. And so he was like, I want to look in. This is a rigid metal tube that he's sticking in people's gullets. He claimed that he was able to get down into the stomach and look at the stomach um, through this rigid metal tube that was lit up by a platinum coil. Um, so if you look at this um, uh, s stock photo of this weird man <laughs> who's <laughs> whose stomach is uh, visible from the outside, um, you can see that it's not a straight line. And really, if you put a straight tube down the esophagus, into the stomach, you would just see a very limited amount of the actual stomach. There's, um, can you see my cursor? Yeah, there's this whole area up here that you wouldn't be able to see. And then you wouldn't be able to really get beyond here because you'd just push right through and, and cause a catastrophic perforation and kill the person, and that wouldn't be good. Um, so the stomach is kind of, it's not, it's not great to look at with a stiff tube. Um, the colon, even less great to look at with a stiff tube. The small bowel, even less great to look at with a stiff tube. Very squiggly. So people wanted to look inside those organs because there's disease in those organs, and they also are just cur they're curious people. They want to know what it looks like in a living person. Um, and, and so um, with the stiff metal tubes, they, there really wasn't any possibility of looking in anything but the stomach in terms of the digestive tract at this point. Um, uh, an innovation that occurred that really helped out the early um, inventors of endoscopes was the incandescent bulb. Um, this is the original uh, carbon filament bulb that Thomas Alva Edison invented in 1889. Um, and people very promptly started putting incandescent bulbs um, encased in different um, insulators at the tips of endoscopes to light up the, light up the, darks, the darkness. Um, this fellow is, is uh, Rudolf Schindler. He was a, a German guy um, who was the pioneer of the flexible endoscope. Um, it was uh, metal and rubber outer casing that um, was just I, uh, it helps me understand it, but it's a weird metaphor. And uh, it w so it was flexible. He could um, control to a degree the flexibility by um, um, there. There's a little control on the end that he could use. Tighten one side or loosen the other to move the tip of the scope. He was using a series of lenses. Um, in his most advanced scope, there were 31 lenses in series uh, to concentrate the light and bring back an image. It's a very sophisticated piece of uh, glass optics. And with this, he was actually able to look inside people's stomachs, diagnose ulcers and cancers and all sorts of important things. He wasn't really able to do anything. He wasn't able to act at a distance with this tool, but he was certainly able to look at stuff uh, in, a, in a fairly clear way because it was flexible and he could kind of control its movement once it was inside the cavity. Um, on the, the, fortunately got a letter of commendation from the University of Chicago's Department of Gastroenterology and um, on the strength of that, he was able to get a visa and come to the United States in 1936. And, um, live on to train this Leonidas Berry, who is a very interesting. He uh, made a lot of advance with the scope. Uh, there's a scope that bears his name, the uh, Ader Gastroscope. He was the first physician to have admitting privileges at many hospitals. He was at the University of Chicago at many hospitals in the Chicago metropolitan area and uh, the first black gastroenterologist and 
there and, uh, and aware of very story of something that might have been um, so a lot of the, in a lot of the sort of foundational innovations that I've talked about like um, like the grinding of lenses the improvement of the quality of mirrors um, smell all of those things were sort of happening independently of the medical technologies that took advantage of them. In this case, they sort of came together. Heinrich Lahm was one of the inventors of fiber optic technology, and he was a, he was a medical student who, whose interests lay in gastroenterology and looking inside of the body with scopes. And, um, and he was a brilliant innovator. Um, it was his idea to sort of get these bundles of extruded glass fibers that could transmit light. Um, the original insight came from reading the papers of John Tyndall, who was a British or Irish uh, physicist in the 1800s who proved that you could bend light by uh, devising a very clever experiment where he sent a beam of light along um, a curved path of flowing water and it sort of sprayed out with the water at the other end and very elegantly demonstrated that light can be bent. Um, and so Heinrich Lahm took that um, insight and applied it to long fibers of glass. And he was really close to developing the first um, fiber optic endoscope. He also was Jewish. Um, he also had to flee. Um, and he came to the United States. He didn't know English. Um, it took him a very long time to get his medical license. and. Ultimately, he did, but he just had a, a small um, family practice in a, in a tiny town in Texas and didn't really um, have the institutional support to advance his um, ideas. This is a picture of fiber optics. It's a very cool idea if you think about it. It's pretty pretty amazing and these cables are just all around us and they're just full of photons going back and forth, carrying our voices places. Basil Hirschewitz um, is considered to be the father of the modern endoscope. He uh, was at, he studied at the University of Chicago and then he went on, this is sad. Um, the next major, major innovation was the of charge coupled devices. This is uh, Willard Boyle and George Smith in their lab um, fiddling with the, the first prototype of a digital camera. A charge coupled device, I don't understand it super deeply, but basically it's a surface on which photon information can be converted to electrons and then transmitted digitally. So um, you have light coming in at different wavelengths and it displaces electrons and then that information can go remotely to a screen and be uh, broadcast as an, a direct image. Um, this is what we all use on our telephones and our cameras and everything that we use to take pictures of things nowadays um, is based on a charge coupled device. And um, they, uh, you know, they can accommodate most of the color charge coupled devices now, except three colors, red, blue, and yellow. And um, between, you know, different combinations of red, blue, yellow, you get all of the colors, or most of the colors, a pretty faithful representation of the world as we perceive it with our eyes, because our eyes have similar mechanics. Um, this is Smith and Boyle in 2009, 35 years later. Why do you think they're dressed up like that? That's right. Um, so they won the Nobel for um, the charge coupled device innovation and they uh, deserved it roundly. This is a, a silly photo, but it was all I could find of someone using a digital video endoscope. So you'll notice with his head down, you know, a few inches from the patient's mouth. 
looking into a tiny eyepiece. Here we are in contemporary video endoscopy age looking at TV screens inside of a room. Um, multiple people can be inside the room. They can be looking at the same thing and talking about the same thing. And it's a big image and you can point at it and, and you know, move the screen around. Um, this particular picture, uh, it, the two, there's two screens. The one that's closer up is actually <laughs> and inject it with dye and then take fluoroscopy of it and look at the and you can do all kinds of stuff. You can take out gallstones um, through, the, through an endoscope instead of having to do a big surgery from the outside. So that's pretty cool. Um, people are doing, is anyone squeamish? <laughs> Too late. Okay, so people are doing all kinds of big surgeries now, like appendectomies or taking, cutting out appendixes, cutting out gallbladders through scopes instead of having to do, any time you cut from the outside, it's obviously worse. It's a risk for infection and other complications. So the less cutting you have to do, the better. Um, if you can do stuff through the holes that we were born with, that's better. So this is, uh, these are pictures of someone uh, removing a gallbladder through an endoscope by kind of like plucking it um, out so it everts and then cutting it off. Um, notes is natural orifice, transluminal endoscopic surgery, doing surgery through a scope basically. Poem is um, per oral endoscopic myotomy, which is doing another kind of surgery with the scope. I think it's funny the way medical people uh, name stuff, so I put them up there to share them with you because they do this all the time. They're kind of nerds. Um, there, there's a, um, a scary picture coming up. So, this is a colon cancer. It's a funky looking thing. It's very scary. So, the main reason people do endoscopy nowadays worldwide is um, to screen for colon cancer and to prevent colon cancer. So that's, that's the main jam. This is what a colon cancer looks like. I don't know, it's kind of interesting to see what stuff looks like. You hear about it all the time. Katie Couric talks about it. Um, this is what it looks like. They mostly look like this. They're big. They have like ulcers in the middle. Um, they're, you can just see it's funky. It doesn't look right. It's asymmetrical. Um, so colon cancer comes from colon polyps. All colon cancers come from colon polyps. Colon polyps are little tiny niblets that take a really long time to have all these compounding mutations occur, long time, seven, 10, 13 years, for them to turn into an actual cancer. So the whole concept with going, you know, putting this uh, garden hose, as my German colleague Amnon Sonnenberg calls it, up people's butts and burning stuff and cutting stuff is um, to find these things, destroy them, and then people don't get colon cancer. That's the idea. So this is just to give you a, a ballpark idea of um, how, how, what kind of impact colon cancer has. This is the fourth, fourth most common cancer but it's the uh, second most common cause of cancer death in the United States. So um, it's, you know, I don't know, as far as cancers go, it's sort of a big deal. Um, it accounts for one in six of every cancer deaths. So if it's preventable, which, you know, it seems to be, if we can cut out these little niblets every so often and prevent them from ever turning into big cancers, um, that's a pretty big impact, um, 50,000 for some other red stuff. Oh, let's turn on the uh, blue-green light, and oh, it's, it's a lot clearer, and you can see the exact borders, and you can see how much of it you remove when you do remove it, and you can make sure that you remove the whole thing. Um, it's also, I'm also using a magnification lens here, and you can sort of start to see the architecture of the polyp, which is important to see because some polyps are very advanced, some of them not so advanced, and you make different decisions about what to do with them based on what you think they are. And so this is, um, so obviously w we have high definition endoscopes now, tons of pixels on that little um, charge coupled device. And um, so 
prevent a cancer that we don't want people to have. Um, so the blue-green light is cool because blood is red. Uh, neoplasms, which are pre, you know, cancerous and precancerous growths like polyps, um, tend to have a more robust blood supply. And so when you shine a blue-green light on red, it turns black. And so you can see really red stuff better when you turn on the blue-green light. So I'm a big fan of the blue-green light. I use it all the time. Um, this is uh, the small intestine that I was looking at a couple days ago of some other person. This, by the way, is from like an hour and a half ago. Kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, this is the, the, the ileum of a, a person last week. Um, you can see this, it's a small intestine, you can see these little villi, these finger-like projections, and they kind of move with waves of peristalsis, like seagrass. It's really actually, I really uh, like the aesthetics of my job. It's very interesting to look at the organs all the time in high definition. So, I did some back of the envelope calculations, and I do about 1,200 upper endoscopies and colonoscopies a year, and so um, I've been doing this for about seven years, and based on the length of the upper endoscopies and the colonoscopies, I've scoped approximately 10.6 miles, <laughs> or <laughs> from where we are right now to Sovie Island, not to the nude beach yet, And uh, <laughs> someday, we can all have our hopes. So that's kind of funny. <laughs> um, I, I calculated that by, uh, by the time I retire, I'll have made it to your mother's house, Willard. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a good one. Um, this is the worldwide distance. <laughs> the, the moon's like. <laughs> That's um, how, my, how many feet of endoscopy uh, is done in 10 years. Um, so I back calculated based Check, just wait, just wait, just wait. So the red stuff is the bad stuff. I was filling with argon. Ooh! <laughs> what? Every time I do this, I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. It's cool. It's like little purple lightning. Um, and I, call, I called this video the emperor because... Um, you know, remember the emperor in the Star Wars movies who does like that thing <laughs> with his hands? Um, that's cool. Okay. That's, um, that's that. Yeah. Um, no, you can control it very well, actually. Um, Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's a lot like, man, I wanna, I'm going to show you this video, and it's going to involve us, like, waiting awkwardly while I do computer stuff in front of everyone. But I want to show it to you, because I think it's cool. So you'll see the reason I want to, oh, here we go. Can you see? No? Oh, it's like not playing in the show slide part. Ah, here we go. Oh. 
Uh, the sound doesn't go. Oh well. So this is me using this uh, loop snare inside of some. Oh, there's a little piece of polyp. You can see I've burnt some stuff up in the upper left, and then there's another one there on the right. And this is what it's like. This is what it's like to do what I do. This is what I see. Moving around, you can see the you know the person the organ moves when the person breathes when the arteries pulse. Oh, got it. Oh. And it's all kind of like it makes you a little seasick the first few times because it's just a person moving and breathing. And there's me. And you can see my hand there. Do you, yeah, you see it's like I'm so I'm I'm fiddling with this thing. Um, You always like kind of half think like I should not come back. I should just go. <laughs> what will they? What will? What will they do? <laughs> so, that's the average person's risk. So it's a you know like three pe two people in this room. So you can acquaint yourself with the um, the tools of the colonoscopist who will eventually do your colonoscopies. Um, so this is the little snare. I don't know. Put it over the light. So it comes in and out with this little pump, with this little thing. And, uh, yeah. So so you see Leroy back here. Um, he's the assistant. And he, he's the one who operates this part. Um, and then I manipulate the scope. And you know, he does that for um, you know, coordination with me. We talk about what we're doing. So this goes in the scope? Is yeah, yeah, I'll, sh I'll show you. I'll show you. Pretty good at making. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was hoping that I could do a. Uh, so. You slide it here, and there's all kinds of tools. There's clips. There's suturing devices. There's things to put rubber bands on things that are bleeding. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. There's um, the argon plasma coagulator that you can slide down. And oh, there it is. And then you, you know, this is deep inside of someone. And uh, the technician is manipulating it to, um, you know, do things. Um, that's the idea. That's what happens now here today. In, in endoscopy. There's a few, I brought some forceps also. They're, they're little tiny um, little jaws that people can look at. Um, I'm gonna show you this again. Just, it's, it kinda goes quickly, so. It's funny, I don't play video games, and I never have. And that's, and a lot of people talk about that. And maybe I don't play video games because I do this for a living. Mm -hmm. So you as the doctor, how are you telling the technician to snare it out? Um, I, say, I say open, close, close slowly. Are you snug? You're snug? OK, cautery, I step on a pedal. It's like playing an organ. Yep. Uh, no, I'm going to go get them. Yeah, it's, there's cautery that runs, there's monopolar electrocautery that run, runs through the metal of this, this mm -hmm. snare. Um, so yeah, they were, they're, it's a little like popcorn, like they get, they get a little like white. Um, this, 
this is 150 feet long. It's, a, it's, it's still fiber optic um, mostly, just because it's, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, yeah, this is a plumber looking at someone's sewer um, in, on a video screen. No, I don't, <laughs> because, <laughs> because these go in humans. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I've done endoscopies on people I know. I work at the VA, and a lot of the people who work there, like in housekeeping and <coughs> facilities management, uh, are veterans. It's, it, there's preferential hi hiring protocols to, um, uh, it, to hire veterans, to give them jobs. And so many of the people I work with are veterans, and so they're also patients of mine. And so it's like now I go to work and I ride the elevator with like the electrician and the um, dishwasher and the uh, business manager and I've done colonoscopies on all of them and I'm like, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and you do your job, I do mine. Um, uh, yeah, I mean it's, it, and, I, and, and an interesting thing happens when gastroenterologists themselves, like, in their 50s, and then they have to, find, like, choose a colleague, you know? Like, who are you going to choose, and what does that mean? And, like, um, oh, no. I have, so that's a great question. And it's, the answer is yes in a lot of, would be yes in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of, um, I have a couple of colleagues who've done upper endoscopies on themselves. Um, so they've, they've, you know, they've thread a upper scope down their own esophagus into their own stomach while they're watching that screen. And they're kind of, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Um, I know that uh, a, a very, um, uh, um, vibrant Brazilian colleague of mine has, has done that to, my, to, to, to himself. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, then, uh, yeah, a lot of my colleagues have done colonoscopies on each other, because a lot of them are in a cohort. They were mostly born in, 19, in the early 1950s. Um, so that's kind of an interesting Whatever I know. I mean, in the end, it's like ultimately I don't know. It's like if you're a, if you if you cut hair and like you cut someone else's hair and they cut your hair. It's what you do. You cut hair, uh, and it's blasé. Really, like when I'm, like, you know, five feet inside of someone burning stuff and like listening to some like you know back catalog Cindy Lauper and like talking about the weather. I'm I'm at work and I'm at work and I'm like concentrating and focusing, but I'm also like it's not. It doesn't feel weird to be deep inside someone's body like that. And I went up there with the other scope because it was absolute. It was a. It was like a surgical emergency, and uh, um, and so I went up there and I just lopped off pieces of the thing with another tool until I got down to the the um, tool I, that was tangled, and then I used a, a little rat tooth forcep to sort of pluck it off, and then I pulled the blind scope out. The one you know you have to turn one off if you're gonna. That was like a moment of total crisis for me, just professionally. Like when I turned the off button on the first scope and then like reconnected the next one because I don't know, I've never read about that. I did some literature research afterwards and um, I didn't uh, see any examples of that that people had written about. And I was like, here goes. And it worked, fortunately. Uh, yeah. That would be, I don't know, I was, I felt, I felt like, I don't know, it was so, it was so scary. Maybe it's been enough time, it was about a year and a half ago. Maybe I'm, I'm ready. So the fluoroscopy, that's right. What about the dying of the <clears throat> Um, it's, it's, uh, 
it's gallium and it's a radioisotopic dye that turns black. So like in an x-ray. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't allow x-rays to pass through it. Okay. So it absorbs x-rays okay. and is black on an x-ray. Is that right, Joe? Well, Oh, yeah. And this, I think in, I think in ERCPs it's black, but I don't know. Because this is what happens when you inject the, the biliary tree with the... Yeah, but that, that, but you reverse the... Right, reverse the right, right. The notes and poems. So people are trying to do stuff that would normally be done by cutting the outside to get to a place um, from a, a hole that you're born with. So doing, um, you know, endoscopic transvaginal hysterectomies, doing um, bariatric surgery from within the stomach instead of by cutting it. They're making a ton of new technology all the time. I mean, it's, it's it, things radi like radically change every three or four years. No, it's been thought a lot about it and written papers and done studies. And then under the, you know, under the, like, the blessing of that experience, I will be able to come back and my colleagues will feel like it's okay for me to do this new thing. So it's, that's, that's a, that's typical. Yeah. What's the risk of perforation? About one in 2,000. So for a routine colonoscopy, <coughs> the risk of perfor perforation Perforation is like the worst thing that can happen during a colonoscopy. Bleeding, the other complications are like bleeding and overdoing it with the drugs. Those are easy-ish easy, easy -ish to fix. Um, all, both of them are more common. Perforation is the rarest and the, the worst complication. So um, it's, it's about one in 2,000 for a screening average risk colonoscopy. That means that it's not like I'm doing this because you're having terrible bleeding and I'm looking for bleeding or you had a CT scan and I know you've got some big tumor there and so I'm working up that that finding it's more like so just an average for an average just you and that's most colonoscopies the risk is about one in 2,000 and perforations like poking a hole where there shouldn't be one um, and most you know yeah that's that's the worst thing that you can have happen as a person who does that thing to people what is the Um, it, there's, so there's two, two main branches of perforation. Per, there's perforations that you know you, di you did and you see them um, and you know you did it and you try like hell to close it. You, there's clips, there's a bear claw thing that's like um, a lady's hair thing um, that you can put on the outside of the scope and basically grab <laughs> the two edges of the tear and try to um, draw them together and, you, and then you lock a cylinder comes over the hinge to lock it in place um, for a big perforation. And for little perforations, there are these little tiny stainless steel end clips that um, you can use. And they go through the, the channel of the scope, and they open. And they have little teeth on either end to kind of grab up bits of bit, the two edges of the hole and draw them together. And if, if you truly perforate someone, you know, it looks like a, um, a bull after they get it angry with the things. Um, it's got like, you know, 20 of the, it's festooned with um, stainless steel clips because you really want to close it. 
if you don't know that you did it or you can't close it, then the person goes um, into observation. We do a CT scan of their belly. Um, we look to see how much air, how much, there shouldn't be air in the, in the abdominal cavity, so how much air is out there, how much inflammation the surrounding organs outside lining has because there's a lot of bacteria inside of the intestinal tract. They start to migrate out into the sterile uh, peritoneum and um, cause inflammation on the outside of other organs. So you do a CT scan. If it looks really bad they, and they, they look like they're doing badly, they have low blood pressure, their heart is fast, they look shitty, you send them to surgery. If they're doing all right, if, um, if they don't seem like they're too sick, oh, um, that's a lot of blood. I should put some clips on that, and uh, I put, you know, I'm going to roll with that. They're like $250 a piece, um, so I'm mindful. I try not to be too wasteful. Um, I try not to just treat my own anxiety by, like, filling people with clips. Um, so I try to be <laughs> aware of the true risks, but I, I put them on, you know, one, once every other day. I'll put a clip on a thing. Um, it feels like it feels good. <laughs> it's like I, I sleep better. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're, um, so they, they started sedating patients in the end of the 19th century by injecting, so around the time of Kussmaul, actually, um, by inject, and it's, it wasn't a great sedation. It was um, atropine and morphine um, injected. Uh, now, so what we do, let me tell you what we do now, just to give you an idea of, like, how good sedation works. We have an IV in a person with continuous access. We have a couple different drugs that we use that make them sleepy, that make them comfortable, that make them totally forgetful and say weird stuff. And, uh, and um, those are continuously going. So, so if a person seems uncomfortable, we give them more. It's just like a, a nice like cascade of um, consciousness suppression. And before, um, it was like you get a shot, it takes an hour to start taking effect. You can't add really during the procedure. And if it's enough, it's enough. If it's not, it's not. Um, and we have a wonderful class of drugs that's about 50, 60 years old called benzodiazepines, of which the most famous member <coughs> is Valium. And those are awesome. And we have a mighty benzodiazepine called Versed, um, or Midazolam, uh, and it is uh, Midazolam. That says it all. Midazolam. It's a. It's so good. I really love it. <laughs> I don't. I mean, not for me. Yeah, you, you're holding a bite of broccoli. You're in your living room. You're like. <laughs> um, I, so one of the things that we like, we kind of like simultaneously roll our eyes about and also like enjoy and relish is people repeating themselves after procedures. It's like, it just, everyone does it and they're like, oh, are we done yet? And you're like, yes, for the seventh time, we are, yes. Um, and you can like say whatever you want to them, they won't remember it. Um, and uh, so um, I had a knee surgery, and I got some Versed, and I was like, I, like, I was like, I know the jam with Versed, like I'm not gonna like talk my ass off, I'm gonna be cool. And one of my neighbors was the first surgical assistant in the case, and he was like, you talked 
so much. And you kept saying the same thing. And I, I, they were, you know, they used gas anesthesia. And so I, 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 was, I was the person who, take, who keeps taking the mask off to talk. We, like, we had, I, I mean, I have this all the time at work where people are like sitting up to talk. And I'm like, sir, I need to put this thing in your mouth and get into your stomach. Like I, you know, and like, um, so I was the person who kept taking this off. And apparently the thing I was saying was, both meta and completely the opposite of meta. I was like, have you guys ever had this drug before? It's crazy. <laughs> and then I'd like lie down before, and then I'd be like, have you guys ever had this drug before? It's crazy. Versed actually suppresses the gag reflex. If people have bad gag reflexes, then we spray the back of their throat with xylocaine or lidocaine, which numbs it. Um, I find Versed to be the, the great solvent for all problems in endoscopy. Um, with tolerance of the procedure, it really uh, paves the way to putting tubes in people. I, I use atropine if I'm having like a cardiopulmonary emergency to resuscitate someone. And I haven't used it, but I would. I mean, that's the only circumstance in which I'd use it now. I'm listening to Chris Dow a while ago for a second, and you were talking about the emperor. <laughs> well, what was his name again? Like, well, what was it blasting at? Like the, and what kind of light was that? It's, um, it's argon plasma coagulation. It, it, it instills argon gas, which is one of the noble gases, into the tube. It fills up the, the, wherever you are, the stomach, the colon, with argon gas. And then um, it sends a current that arcs across the, the neutral gas to the, to, you put a grounding pad on the person. And so the electricity seeks the, the grounding pad. I do now. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks for listening. Yeah, of course. All right, we uh, return on May 13th with Jelly Helm of Studio Jelly with his talk, A Beginner's Intro to Joseph Campbell, Story and the Human Adventure. Who am I? Where did I come from? What happens when I die? How do I spend my life? What do the things that happen to me mean? For 45,000 years, humans have used story to wrestle with these questions. In this informal and personal presentation, award-winning communicator and story enthusiast Jelly Helm will share maps and charts from Joseph Campbell Ken Wilbur and others to help explain the basics of story and how it informs our lives and our culture. It ought to be fun and perhaps encouragement to reconnect with your own deep story. It should be really good. Um, let's have another round of applause. For Sean. Uh, I encourage you to come up and take a look at some of these tools. Yeah. They're pretty, they're pretty amazing. Yeah, seriously, please. Any questions that you're afraid to ask, where you can ask more intimately. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. That's awesome. At the Charles, we gotta get you into the welding shop. It's a very similar concept. Yeah. This is another, uh, this is the forcep. I'm one of those people that has the opposite effect with Merced. I went oh, yeah, you cataract. have paradoxical, yeah. paradoxical. And I went for cataract it's surgery. It's a kebab. You put, you can spike. Um, and they had to actually, on my first one, they gave me and I badly reacted. The doctor almost sent me home. <laughs> so bad. So the second one, I just told him, don't give me anything. Right, right. And so what would I do in that case? I would, would use it. I would use um, Benadryl, uh, intravenous Benadryl, and a bunch of fentanyl. And then I find with people who have paradoxical reaction to Versed that if you give them like a homeopathic like normally I give people like six milligrams, eight milligrams of Versed. I've, I've, with a lot of people who come to me with a history of paradoxical reaction to Versed, 
I'll give them like more fentanyl, more Benadryl, and then I'll give them just the slightest drop, like 0.5 milligrams of Versed, and they don't have the paradoxical reaction where they're like struggling and, and more agitated. alert and agitated. Um, and it just kind of, it's like, I don't know, like a martini, it's like the, uh, um, the, 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 from, from, from. Fentanyl, yeah. Fentanyl. Opioid narcotics. Yeah. 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 Ye